Okay, so I think uh, maybe we'll kind of start our uh, talk tonight. And uh, well, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Bess Asmida from the University of Illinois at Chicago to come to give us her uh, talk tonight. And uh, for, for anyone who does not know uh, Dr. Smida, let me give her introduction here. So Dr. Bessa Smida is an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois at uh, Chicago. Dr. Smida got her undergraduate, undergraduate degree from Higher School of Communication of Tunis and a later master and a PhD degree from the University of Quebec in Montreal in Canada in 1998 and 2006, respectively. From 1999 to 2015, she, had, uh, she held several research and academic positions in Rogers Wiley's in Montreal in Canada, Harvard University, and Purdue University in the US before she joined the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2015. And Dr. Smeda's research focus, research focused on the area of wireless communication theory. She currently serves as editor for the IEEE transactions on wireless communication, editor of the IEEE Open Journal of the, of the Communication Society, and lead a guest editor for the Censors Open Access Journal. Uh, she was a recipient of the award of the Insight into Diversity magazine's 100 Inspiring Women in STEM in 2015, Academic Gold Medal of the Governor General of Canada in 2007, and the NSF Career Award in 2015. Moreover, Dr. Smida is a distinguished speaker of IEEE Communication Society of 2022, and currently she serves as the North American uh, Region 4 representative. Uh, with that, please join me to welcome uh, Dr. Smida. So, uh, so Dr. Smida, the uh, podium is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. So let me just... Uh share the slides yeah okay i hope you can see the slides is that uh, correct okay uh, i guess you can hear me okay is that is that okay yep. Yep. yes okay thank you very much so uh thank you again for the introduction so um i'm an associate professor uh, has been uh, introduced uh, electrical and computer engineering at the university of illinois chicago just for the fun fact we actually get rid of the at chicago so now it's just university of illinois chicago without the at uh, so the talk today i thought it would be interesting to uh, to talk about one of my recent research which is integrated sensing and communication for a 6G network. Uh, so I'll start a little bit by an introduction of a little bit of the team and then a little bit of what we, I think is the foundation over it. Uh, we build this integrated sensing and communication, which is in-band Fujiplex. And then we get to the application of uh, integrated sensing and communication. I, I personally like to have questions during the talk. So if you have uh, any question, you can just ask. I cannot read the chat at the same time when I'm talking, but uh, it's okay to stop me and ask questions. But if you want to wait at the end, that's also okay. Okay, so I'm part of what we call the NICES lab. So the NICES lab stands for Network Information Communication and Engineering System Lab. So that's the NICES lab at UIC, uh, literally. So it was founded in 2015. That's the year I joined UIC. Um, and then the focus for this lab is to have a better understanding of uh, communication or wireless communication, uh, all the way from theory all the way to practice. So we have at the same time testbed, indoor testbed, etc. But also we have a lot of research that is done and information theory. Um, uh, so we just get all, so it includes information theory, uh, signal processing for communication, communication theory, network, 
and of course, all with its hardware and implementation for the network itself. Um, as of right now, it's composed of five co-directors. So it's myself, Professor DeVroy, Professor Turinetti, Professor Kionoku, and Professor Sivroglu. And then it's usually around, uh, on average, around 20 students and postdoc follow. Um, most of the funding for uh, the NICES lab comes from NSF and the DOD or Department of Defense. And this is particularly true for today's topic. So today's topic is also uh, funded by uh, partially part of NSF and DOD. Um, just a little bit of picture of what's happening around. So this is kind of some of the students uh, over the year, you can see by the hairstyle change that actually it's over many years since I joined. It's a little bit of the co-director and the student at the NICES lab. Okay, so let's get to the a little bit the, the topic itself. I think everyone who gets to the 5G knows that recently there is a little bit of, I will say, shift change um, in the wireless communication. Uh, we used to focus mainly on higher and higher throughput. And I think uh, whoever is familiar with 5G would know that there is definitively a focus on three different servers now. So the, the throughput is still there. So I would say, Increasing the broadband and the throughput is in what we call the enhanced mobile broadband service. So we still need to increase the throughput, but it's not the only uh, it's not the only ch the only service that we will provide. We will talk about what we call a URLCC, so that's ultra reliable low latency. So this this application here, the focus is more on latency. We want a system that be very reactive. That will be, of course, very um, used when we are using, when we try to control some robot to do any application that it's time sensitive. Factory will be one example of that. Autonomous car will be another example. So it's more about the latency, much more about the uh, throughput. So throughput, one way to see throughput, if you want to watch a video, you need a lot of high data rates. In terms of latency, when you are asking a robot or machine to execute a task, it's not about the data rate. You're not sending an image usually you send in terms of data rate. It's a low data rate signal, but you, what you care about it, it's, it's arrive on time and very quickly. And the focus is more on the uh, latency and the reliability. You want that information to arrive very quickly and accurately. And one way to think about it is like controlling um, or these UAVs, etc. So stuff like that. The other one, which is a massive machine um, type communication. So this is more of what we commonly call IoT network. So this is also another network that it's not really the data rate that it's important and not necessarily either the latency. So imagine you have a bunch of sensors sent somewhere to detect, I don't know, like temperature or stuff like that around the city or for building or for bridge. So it's not the data rate, it's not the latency. I think basically what this requirement is, there will be a lot of them. There will be trying to communicate at the same time. So you need kind of to figure out a way to uh, manage this transmission. So I think the keyword here is massive uh, machine type communications. There will be a lot of those IoT at the same time, but also I think those will add this component of energy that we worked on it in communication, I would say, but we never actually focus on make the system more energy efficient. So there is definitively with, uh, with the MTC, um, uh, uh, emphasis on the energy. So this is, I would say, the main idea of this slide is just to show you that um, as we go with the next generation of network, we're going a little bit further from just increasing the data rate to a different component, different application. So, so this is kind of, I think everyone agreed on the part that it's a little bit uh, our team or our kind of personal or uh, something that we can discuss for sure is what will happen with 6G. So I personally think that sensing will be a huge component of 6G. Um, I think it's or, or, already we do a lot of sensing, but sensing for communication purpose. So it's not sensing for localization or tracking, but we definitely were very close to add sensing to the communication. And I think uh, adding that extra component of um, environment awareness uh, will help a lot and we can talk a lot about this um, application. So I think definitively the next component for 6G will be sensing. Of course, there will be a lot of artificial intelligence on machine uh, learning. That's a tool that will apply to everything. But I will say a little bit the, the new component 
is uh, sensing or do, using wireless um, uh, signals. So the candidate here, and, and I, I put a little bit of this candidate here on the side, I think we will be, I'd be using them as we go. I would say massive MIMO or MIMO in general, uh, multiple using multiple antenna at the transmitter receiver is definitively one of the tools that will help a lot for all this application, but definitely for sensing, going toward millimeter wave and eventually terahertz. I'm, I don't think terahertz would be in 6G, uh, but definitely millimeter wave is already there in 5G, and I think it will stay there, and which maybe may be used more sensing too. And then, of course, this use of meta surfaces that will, could be a nicer placement for um, this massive uh, antenna. Of course, we can use meta surfaces for all other reason, but I think for today topic, the meta surface will be more focused on as a, a more sophisticated way of using antenna. But I will say the most com important component to make the sensing working is what we call a full duplex. So let me just uh, kind of also talk about a little bit where we are in terms of uh, um, uh, a protocol and advancement with 3GPP. So uh, we are very happy to see that in re release 18, finally, Fujiplex uh, is officially there. So we have been waiting for Fujiplex for a while now, and we're happy to see that it's, it's there. So I will explain in detail what is Fujiplex, what's the challenge, and what's it bring. But just for now, keep in mind that it actually works in terms of enhancing the coverage. So it will work very nicely for um, IoT. It will reduce the latency, so it will work very nicely also for ultra uh, uh, reliable low latency uh, network. Uh, it will also increase the throughput, so it will work also very nicely in um, enhanced uh, broadband mobile uh, network. So it can help in all these components, but also we'll show today that it also can help with the sensing uh, itself, okay? So uh, so let's let's dig, dig deep and get into what is this full duplex communication. I would say um, today, uh, all of the network, and this, this slides used to be absolutely true i would say up to maybe six or seven months ago we we have some full duplex network happening right now but let's say up to six months ago most of the all the network are either a tdd or ftd which means that if you have a transmitter and receiver so where imagine let's think of uh bidirectional communication if you want to Transmitter and receiver, base station, or a mobile, or mobile base station in communication. Usually, when they are sending to each other's information to make the bidirectionality function, we use TDD, which means either the transmitter one sends a certain time slot, and then it's silence. Then transmitter two will send to the second time slot. So that's what we call the TDD or time division duplex. The other way to do it that's also very common is actually to separate the transmit and received signal over different frequencies. So that's what we call FDD um, or frequency division duplex. Um, using TDD or using FDD from communication theory point of view, it's, it's very similar. Basically, we are considering the wireless channel as a unit and we're kind of splitting it between uplink and downlink, if you want to consider the mobile, or between transmit and receive between two uh, um, in case of bidirectional communication. Uh, of course, the best way is to, to actually use this, to, to allow those two units to transmit and receive at the same time over the same frequency, and that will allow us for full duplex. By allowing the, the signal to transmit and receive at the same time, we actually, at least theoretically, we are able to increase the spectrum efficiency by double. Basically, if you, if you used to get silence in terms of TDD for a while and then let the other device communicate, by having full duplex, this will allow you to be talking double the time. So in a sense, it's have the potential to double the spectrum efficiency. So of course, the number two, the doubling the spectrum efficiency, I want you to take it into consideration. It can actually be higher than two, but most of the time it will lo lo lower than two, and I can discuss how this uh, spectrum efficiency would work in this case. So if you if we let basically uh, the full duplex work, uh, I want to just show you here a little bit of the potential or what we can do with this full duplex application. And then I will talk about the challenge. So if you allow the transmitter and receiver to send and receive at the same time, 
One way to think about it, if like if you have a base station, this is the first uh, picture on the left. I don't know if you can see the mouse, but the first picture on the left. This means if you, or the base station will will in a term of access link will be communicating with the phone, but at the same time it will have a backhaul link. So the backhaul links is usually through fiber optics, but in a case it's used wireless. This will allow the base station to, at the same time, be communicating with the mobile and co also communicating uh, through the, uh, th the backhaul link at the same time. Another application, of course, is, um, and this is the picture on the left uh, down. So this is, uh, of course, for tactile communication or electronic farewell. If you are allowed to transmit and receive, then uh, you can jam and receive at the same time. You can do all kind of combination of jamming, sensing, et cetera, at the same time. Uh, one other uh, technique, this is the right uh, picture um, on top, is to use the, um, the, the, the uplink, not really for data, it could be data, of course, but to use it more for tuning the antenna. And this is definitely very useful when we have massive MIMO with a lot of antenna millimeter wave. So we wanted the antenna to be really always directed toward the user. One way to do it is to have an uplink that it's all dedicated to what we call control data. So the downlink will be for data and the uplink is for control. And of course, last but not least is the topic of today. So this is the right picture on um, the right, uh, the picture on the right uh, down. So that's when we integrate that actually sensing and communication. So the downlink will be for data and then the uplink will be for uh, sensing. So how to make all this application happen in, in general, I would say uh, the keyword. So another, uh, so this is one, uh, one slide. Another motivation for um, connecting sensing and communication is actually over, over the years, we always have a radar system, which are the one used for sensing, um, being almost all the time in adjacent or very close bandwidth as the communication system. And you can see here, I have many examples goes all the way from L band to millimeter wave recently. We always have radar close to some communication system. And we remember, I don't know if you heard in the news recently, all this idea about the radar used for airplane and then the, that being adjacent to 5G bandwidth. So radar and communication have been always in some kind of adjacent uh, bandwidth. And I think with integrated sensing and communication, we just kind of pushed a little bit further and get them both in the same bandwidth. But they are already operating in very close uh, bandwidth. So that's uh, another motivation for this. So we talked about uh, the, 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 the kind of the good thing if we allow transmitter to transmit, receive at the same time, the same frequency. But of course, there is a big issue. And here it's uh, usually very intuitive. Either if you consider that you have, you're have using the same antenna or if you're using multiple antenna, and the issue is, of course, what we call the self-interference. So one way to think about it, if you allow the transmitter and the receiver to be at the same time functioning, that means you're really sending a very, very strong signal, and then you're trying to receive here a very weak signal, and this is what we have as green. So it's a weak because it's... It, it propagates from the transmission all the way to the receiver. So it's much, much weaker signal than what you're sending uh, from your antenna. Those, these phenomena will happen either if you're using the same antenna, you can use the same antenna, transmit, receive, same time, same frequency, all if you use different antenna, one or more antenna. I will say one way to evaluate how the difference in power is between the received signal, it's here in green, so and then the transmitted and the, the interference is uh, to see it in this plot. So here we have an example, assuming that we have a transmit power of 30 dBm, and we have somehow uh, managed to separate the two antenna or to use a circulator between the transmit and receive, uh, the receive side, and that allow us to have roughly 20 dB will be something um, practically kind of agreed on. Um, the receive signal is usually way lower here, like in green, and you can see that you have a self-interference that is roughly 100 dB uh, higher than the received signal. Uh, one way to think about it, I don't know if you, for, for those who are not maybe uh, from the field, one way to think about it, like you're whispering to someone and there is an airplane that it's landing at the same time. It's really the difference between the received signal and your self-interference is absolutely uh, uh, huge. 
I would say the advantage there, so, and this is one of the reasons why full duplex was never implemented so far, because we really would like to avoid the self-interference. That was the first idea, and we kind of stick with, let's avoid the self-interference because we cannot cancel it. It's just way too huge to be canceled. Um, but I think one, one advantage, though, is it's self-interference. It's not someone interfering that you don't know what's the signal. The transmitter is interfering with the receiver, so you know at the receiver side what have been sent, and, and that's a big advantage, and that's usually uh, the intuition or the idea behind most of the self-interference cancellation technique uh, that we have right now. I would say generally the self-interference cancellation technique is, um, I, I would just, uh, usually what we try to do is, uh, we try to do it at the analog level before we get any way close to the digital level. And that's very important. And here again, if you look at the picture on the right, so if you get that signal that it's um, already 110 dB higher, then the other signal, and you get them through your analog to digital converter, you completely lose the signal. Of course, depending on the range and depending on the detail, but usually with that difference, your signal is already gone. So you need, we need to do something at the analog level before we get into the digital level. And I will say, usually we have three ways of doing self-consolation, and we will do them all. It's a combination. I'm a strong believer that we have to do them all. The first part is the propagation. Separate the transmit antenna and receive antenna as far as you can. Uh, we can use a circulator. We can use uh, cross-polarization. And we can use beam forming. And I hear it highlighted in red, spatial separation. Because by making your beam narrower, if you use multiple antenna and you do those, those beam, you get your beam toward the, the, the transmitter. And it allow you to get much less interference from the adjacent uh, transmitter. So first part is what we call propagation or analog cancellation or antenna cancellation. The second usually um, uh, step with self-interference, this part will give you some, depending on the case, all the way to up to 40 dB. It's not enough. We need it to what we call analog RF cancellation. This, this second part, it usually means you know what you're sending as a signal, you use that knowledge to recreate the um, interference signal and to add a negative sign to it and you add it to your receive, uh, your receive it signal so it allow you to cancel the interference. So basically it's the recreation of the interference and that's making it just a negative sign. So adding it to your uh, uh, self-interference, it will cancel uh, each other, cancel negatively in a sense. The third uh, uh, component, it's very important, is once this is done, this will give you a, a, a little of level that allow to get the signal through the analog to digital converter. Once you are there, we need to do some digital cancellation. I would say generally digital, digital cancellation, most of the approach we use are approach that we used already in communication before. The only, some new stuff is because of the difference of, in power, some nonlinearity of the receiver or our transmitter have to be taken into account. Um, we can use machine learning for those, uh, of course, to learn a little bit of this imperfection. So we have a lot of, some of the result about that. But I would say the digital constellation is the easiest part. We just borrow from what we have been doing so far. And because it's done at the signal processing level, it's much easier to handle than uh, the RF constellation and the antenna constellation that needs a little bit of uh, RF knowledge plus communication theory. The, the good news though, with a combination of all these three techniques, we are actually able to get uh, the full duplex finally functioning. So I will say in the last uh, decade or so, we have been a lot of uh, test bed have been in different university, Stanford, Rice. Um, I also have a test bed myself. When we actually test that this is happening, we can actually transmit receive at the same time and uh, we can have uh, double the spectrum efficiency in most of the cases or at least go to a very reasonable good level of uh, spectrum efficiency. 
Uh, one other thing that I thought is very important, and here just to route it toward um, uh, the sensing, which is the important part of our talk today, is uh, using a mind. So as I said, the, that first part of the constellation, uh, antenna constellation, could be done through beam forming. And I think, uh, especially if we consider millimeter wave for sensing, I think we needed massive MIMO. We needed a lot of antenna to transmit. Uh, and using that beam forming to cancel the self-interference would be a huge thing. So we assume it, of course, that we have a massive MIMO setting. Uh, one of the limitations of massive MIMO is you don't want to have an RF shell per antenna, especially if you have many antenna. Let's say you have just the 128 antenna. That's some of the simulation result I have. So we will always adapt what we call a hybrid um, uh, a hybrid beamforming approach. So we reduce the number of RF chain, and then for and we reduce the number, and the antenna will be just linked to what we call analog beamformer, or basically some kind of phase shifter. So this is just for complexity uh, issue. It's not needed. It's actually better to be completely with as many RF chain as possible. But for complexity, we can really have the hybrid uh, constellation, and that's what we assumed. Um, here today for the result I will show you, okay? And we, we have very good result with that, so. So um, the other thing is um, when we have multiple antenna and multiple uh, receive uh, MIMO setting, that means the constellation, like every transmit antenna will interfere with every receive antenna, okay? So then if you have, let's say 64 by 64 massive antenna, that means you have a 64 square, constellation that has to be done. And this is, I'm talking about the second level of constellation, which is the RF constellation. So you have to create the signal transmitted from antenna one, recreated through the, uh, the, the channel from transmit one to receive one and subtract it. And then you do the same, transmit one, receive two and etc. So this is clearly unfeasible. So besides the number of chain that cannot be very high, the RF chain, also, we cannot have a point-to-point -point, um, analog canceller from every transmitter receiver antenna. So the first thing we did in our system is actually we moved this um, analog canceller from this side. We put it just before this analog beamformer. So basically, we make this number related to the RF chain. So if you have 64 by 64 antenna, but those antenna have only four RF chain, 64, but they have only four RF chain, then I will have 16 uh, um, RF counselor instead of, um, sorry, the mouse is not stable, instead of 64 square. So that's reduced a lot the RF uh, component in the, for the constellation. And that's what we assume here. So within that setting, millimeter waves, just a reminder, so we will be be talking about Fujiplex transmitting and receiving at the same time. We'll be talking for, with MIMO, millimeter wave frequency, that's for the simulation. Uh, you could have it for other frequency, but that's the, the, the frequency we adapt. We consider this is just for the, uh, um, because it's a 5G, 6G, that's OFDM. We can definitively consider another modulation, but for now, uh, OFDM is uh, the one that's considered. And then, of course, we consider uh, a way to get this self-interference just within the uh, uh, RF chain, not at the antenna level, to reduce the complexity. So based on that, this is what we propose. So as I, as I said, said, notice that the analog counselor is actually at the RF chain. It's not among the antenna. So here I have NB transmit antenna, NB receive antenna. I will be in a downlink sending signal to this uh, unit. We also extend it to the case when you have more than one um, receiver, data receiver. But I will be at the same time trying to get the uh, those radar ta targets. So those are target uh, kind of pick it on the environment and we try to get the direction of arrival, we try to get the speed, uh, the range, and the, uh, based on the this speed delay Doppler, the, the Doppler shift would give us the velocity, basically. So again, as you can see here, this, the uplink and downlink is happening at the same time. You're sending data, you're receiving self-interference, and you're receiving the reflected signal. And the reflected signal is the one that it's acted like a radar. So you send the communication signal, you listen to the echo, and based on the echo, we try to find the direction of arrival, 
the range and the velocity. Okay, so I get a little bit into the detail. You, I can get, uh, I can get in more detailed question, but I will just kind of go fast into the detail of the the simulation itself. I will say the optimization. Most of the innovation in this work is actually to how we optimize the digital beamforming and the analog beamforming. So those phase shifter and the precoder, if you want, within some constraints. So we have a reasonable. Uh, uh, decoder that it's have a finite size and we just pick among those that will give you different beams so basically we have different choices of beam and we need to pick the beam direction as the one uh, that we are target we will have of course constraint over power so that's the constraint of power i'm not getting into all the detail of what's the variable but you can ask me if you want but we of course have uh, overall constraint over the transmit power here again uh, don't don't uh, panic much about the equation. Uh, just this is what happened when you have. Uh, so we need if you, for those who need it, I will say um, at the receiver from all you will receive the data from, from all the K targets. They will be all shifted due to the delay, the different delay from the different target. They will have different Doppler, of course, depending on the speed. And then of course, I think the component here is the self interference that it's added plus the noise. So that's a little bit uh, right quick. And of course, at the receiver side, we do the same in terms of beamforming. So we do the beamforming at the RF side to at the receiver side. So again, I will not, uh, maybe I will skip the detail about this, uh, this section, but I will say here, this is for those who wanna know a little bit more how we sense. So we use actually a, a very common technique. It's not a, a new, it's really something that used before. It's music. I, I think what is, what is new though is where to apply it and what's the order that to apply it. So we just do covariance matrix. We use the subspace partition and then we just uh, pick using the eigenvalue, the composition, the highest value that will give us the direction of arrival. As I said, I would say the most important part is the order on which we actually did this estimation. So we estimate the direction of arrival. After that, using the likelihood function, we get the, uh, the, the range and the speed. So that will give us the Doppler and delay um, with a signal. And then of course, that will allow us to work on the, uh, on the estimation part. So, I want to just show you a little bit of the results. So to show you the result, uh, I have to show you a little bit some of the parameter for the simulations. We consider 128 by 128 uh, antenna, so transmitter receive antenna. Each uh, antenna we have only, uh, the, the receiver user use only for antenna. We only have eight transmitter receive chain. So that's in terms of reducing the antenna. We talk about millimeter wave around 28 gigahertz. Uh, we have this bandwidth, 100 megahertz of the bandwidth. So we have all this specificity about the FDM and try to, to stick with 5G or 6G. And then, of course, in terms of um, analog um, uh, here, in terms of analog um, uh, to digital converter, we're talking about a range of 60 dB. As I said, it's important to know how much your uh, analog and converter can cover before uh, how much you need analog before you get to that. So of course here, all the analog and beamforming it's done to allow the, uh, the chain not to saturate. So we want it to be within the dynamic range of the analog to digital converter. And that's kind of a little bit the optimizations that we did. So uh, let me show you a little bit the result here. So this is the case for six uh, radar target. Uh, so the plot here, it shows this is kind of the, the transmitter. And this is the location um, of the different target. This is the range, so this is in meter. So those are the range, and this is kind of direction of arrival with angles. And you can see, so this is in red is the true radar target, and in uh, cross is the one that we get through the estimation, but we did very well. Uh, for a transmit bandwidth of 30 dBm, and the range is to the couple of meters, so this is very good for uh, outdoor. Uh, we have here the velocity, so for all the same target, we have different velocity, of course. This is in um, uh, 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 this is the range, and so this is the velocity in kilometer per hour, and you can see that we get very close, but not as good as actually the direction of a live air range. So we are a little bit off here and there, but very good for uh, like vehicular communication, uh, vehicular um, or autonomous cars. Uh, it's, it's very good for that. 
Um, of course, we tried. So here, even when the, the angle between two angles are within 10 and 12 dB, uh, we can still be able to separate those two targets. So that's uh, very good. So music is actually working uh, reasonably well. We reduced the transmit power for 10 dBm, which is kind of as if uh, extending the range is very similar. And of course, the precision is reduced. So everything as expected functioning as expected. But we are happy with the result that we have uh, overall. Okay, so we have a little bit of sensing error. It's of course related to the to the power, so that's very important. Uh, in terms of the downlink, remember when we're talking here, we're talking about we have a downlink, we're sending data, and we are sensing with the feedback. So the, in terms of downlink, the downlink is really working also very well. So we have the data, and that's why it's integrated sensing and communication. So the the downlink is working very well. We are at 1.5 bits per hertz from the ideal case. Ideal case means you really know the CSI perfectly. So it's just there for comparison, but really it's not uh, what you have to do. And of course, as we, this is the percentage of tap. This is, shows that as we add more in terms of um, analog cancellation, as we are ready to increase the complexity, we can get better and better performance uh, in terms of uh, downlink rate, uh, uh, for different transmit power. So I think this is kind of discover a little bit of uh, this result. So I think basically what I tried to uh, to show you today that by uh, based on in-band full duplex, we can actually do an integrated sensing and communication for millimeter wave and use a MIMO or massive MIMO. Um, we uh, consider millimeter millimeter wave, we consider multiple radar targets. Eventually, we expanded this work to consider multiple uh, data receiver too. So we can have multiple data receiver and multiple radar target at the same time. And we can, with using some beamforming accurately, um, um, kind of uh, uh, update the performance. So um, of course, so I want to just thank a little bit at the end. So this is a of course, a collaborative effort with my uh, previous PhD students, uh, um, uh, Atik Islam. He's now with the Globcom working on uh, Fujiplex. He just joined it this summer. And of course, my um, uh, uh, from Greece collaborator, George uh, Alexandropoulos, who was also my collaborator. He helped a lot with the massive MIMO um, evaluation. So uh, this will be all. Any question? Dr. Smita, great talk. So, any uh, questions from audience? Uh, maybe I can ask your uh, Ms. Dada question here. And uh, I'm not a person in the field of communication. Just to uh, just to ask, you, I think uh, from my understanding that to the scheme, the mixtures, the uh, frequency transmission and time. Uh, Together, not using frequency distribution or time distribution, the uh, the core difficulty is to uh, cancel the interface. So interference, yes, yes, interference that's uh, from yes. the receiver and uh, the yes, that's correct. So that's correct. Right. That definitely need to increase the computation power of the of the of the devices. Is that uh, will be an obstacle for the uh, devices? In the application, in the real world, that uh, the devices may not have that computational power to uh, to cancel those interference. Uh, I would say it's it's definitely more complex than if you don't do full duplex, but it's not that complex. And let me just show you one slide here. Tell you why I. <clears throat> So here, I, I of course, you will need a little bit of digital constellations. And so this is more processing. So this is more like the processing that you need to do. In terms of the RF and uh, antenna constellation part, if you're doing MIMO and you are already doing some beam forming, so you're making your beam narrow toward the transmitter, you're automatically reducing some of the self-interference. So it would not add much to the complexity it will add another constraint in terms of your uh, beam forming. So when you're designing your beam, when you try to make your beam narrow, you don't only try to maximize the gain toward your target uh, receiver, but also you want to cancel the self-interference from the adjacent antenna. So it's another constraint, but it does not add not much of the complexity. 
Other way to do, if you want to add more transmitter and more receiver to work on that, I would say, yeah, that will add a little bit in terms of the hardware complexity, uh, adding more uh, transmitter and receiver. Again, the RF parts, again, it could be done with uh, constellation tabs that are very expensive for each line. You will cancel one transmitter, one receiver at a time. But of course, you can do it with much cheaper RF component and still end up with that result. So I would say in general, it's definitely more complex than uh, half duplex uh, receiver, but it's really cheap enough that almost everyone can have an in-band test and they can try it at home. It's not that complex. Great. So any other questions? So I have a question based on your block diagrams. I see you have um, analog RF type domain there and you have a digital domain. When yes. Doing the signal, um, sim you talk about simulation analysis, right? Yes. Are you writing your own code? Is that like Python type analysis or MATLAB, or do you have some commercially available tools that you use for that cross domain analysis? Yes. So I have, I mean, I, I, we, we have done many kinds. So what I have in the lab, I have a single antenna with a circulator. So that's a hardware that we built and we have uh, the analog. So that's actually some of those boxes. I don't know the, I don't know, software defined kind of boxes. So they have their own language and that's how we build that system. We try to link them to MATLAB, but usually it's not very uh, adequate. In terms of integrated sensing and communication that you have today, uh, the results are done by uh, uh, MATLAB. In terms of the digital constellation, when we consider the nonlinearity of the low noise amplifier, the power amplifier, that part is done with machine learning and we use Python for it. So I would say it's, it's depending on what's the, the problem. Okay. But we, we target the system with different ways and we use different tools for each uh, issue. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. No problem. Yeah, let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Smith again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you later. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.